In this lecture, we're going to prove the Morse equivalence, which is uh, the equivalence on the level of homology between the original chain complex of a simplicial complex and the much smaller reduced one corresponding to an acyclic partial matching. So to get our notation straight, let K be a simplicial complex and sigma an acyclic partial matching on K. And here is the result that we're going to focus on, uh, I think, exclusively in this lecture. It's the following. The chain complexes, uh, the first one is the usual simplicial chain complex of K, and the second one is the Morse one, which we built in the previous lecture. So these two are chain homotopy equivalent. So what that means, if you remember, is that there exist chain maps uh, and I'll call the first one psi and this is going to take us from the big complex down to the small one and I'll call the second one phi which is going to take us from the small one to the big one. So C sigma to C K. Okay. Um, so that phi composed with psi and psi composed with phi are chain homotopy equivalent, are chain homotopic rather, to the identity maps. On uh, one way, the composition is going to be chain homotopic to the identity map on the Morse complex. And the other way, it's going to be the identity map on the original simplicial chain complex. So uh, that's what we want to prove. And um, I think the best way to approach uh, this uh, is, to, uh, is to break it down into two steps. Uh, the first step is the basic engine. And the second step is just repeating the first step over and over. So in the first step, we just assume uh, that sigma contains only one pair. Uh, so it's going to be a single simplex uh, pair, sigma less than tau. And let's just say that the dimension of tau equals k, which forces the dimension of sigma to equal k minus 1. So that's it. All of sigma, all the complexities worrying about acyclicity are gone. It's just a single pair. So we're going to remove uh, so, so what this map psi is going to do in the simple case is just remove these two simplices, sigma and tau, from uh, from k, and this phi is going to somehow add them back. And we'll show that this is an equivalence, and in the second step, we will do this, assuming sigma contains lots of pairs, we'll do this once for every pair, and somehow um, uh, link together these chain homotopy equivalences um, one pair at a time. Uh, from the from the big complex all the way down to the small Morse complex and then back. And so if you restrict to this very special case um, where uh, sigma is a face of tau and that's the only um, pair uh, that, that your acyclic partial matching has, then life becomes very, very straightforward um, in, in the sense that once you have the right picture in your mind, there's only one sequence of correct uh, operations that'll get you psi and phi and, and explain as a bonus the weird sum over paths formula we had for the Morse boundary operator. So let's let's look at this ma you know magic picture that puts all of this together. So the magic picture is you take the uh, matrix representation of the boundary uh, map, the simplicial boundary map of, uh, of the uh, simplicial complex K. So what it's going to have up here are all the K dimensional simplices. Those are going to index the columns, and the rows are going to be indexed by K minus 1 dimensional simplices. So, um, so let's, uh, let's say tau is going to be certainly one of our K dimensional simplices, sigma is going to be certainly one of our K minus 1 dimensional simplices, and I also need sort of just to explain what happens on this whole matrix uh, two placeholders. So let's take a random different from tau one of the k-dimensional simplices alpha, and then another k-minus one-dimensional simplex omega. And now, corresponding to these four simplices that we've chosen, there are four numbers that are going to be important. 
the first one is this incidence between tau and sigma, which we know for a fact because sigma is a face of tau of co-dimension one. Whatever on earth that number is, I mean, okay, it's either plus one or minus one, but it's not zero. That's all we need right now. It's not zero. Uh, here we have some number tau omega, and we have no control over it. It's zero minus one plus one, depending on whether or not omega is an odd, even, or not a face of tau. Similarly, alpha omega, no control over this either, and alpha sigma. Again, we have no knowledge except for the, the entry in red. All the others could be whatever they want. The entry in red can just not be zero. It must be plus or minus one. Um, and so if you look um, at this matrix, it has tons of entries. I mean, I've, I've only written out four, but there could be thousands and thousands of k simplices and millions and millions of k minus one simplices. But these four are all we focus on right now. And uh, the idea is to use uh, row and column operations to clear out uh, tau's column and sigma's row. So, which is a fancy way of saying, or not fancy way of saying, that we want this uh, entry in red to become a pivot for both its row and its column. Uh, and if you want to do that, then for every possible alpha and omega, you are forced to contemplate how to clear out this entry. You, have, you want to make that a zero if you want to clear out the column for tau. And similarly, this entry, you want to make it a zero if you want to clear out the row of sigma. And what we're going to do is implement those row operations one at a time and column operations one at a time and just sort of tabulate what happens as a result of those operations to this arbitrary incidence between alpha and omega. Which um, So we want, to, we want to clear out the rows and columns, uh, sorry, the one row of sigma and the one column of tau, and, and look at the effect of those row and column operations on this um, arbitrary alpha omega incidence in the matrix. So the column operations we need uh, and the row operations we need are the following. So let's divide them in two because they're different. Okay, so if you stare at that matrix for a while, um, all you need is that the column of alpha should be modified by the elementary column operation where we add some scalar multiple. And the scalar you need is, of course, um, alpha sigma divided by tau sigma with giant minus sign. And all of that should be multiplied by the column of tau. So this scalar, don't forget it, uh, is going to be important. So I'll make it red. Um, similarly, uh, the row operation you need is that the row of omega is going to get itself plus, or rather minus again. Uh, there's a scalar, which is, uh, let's write it in blue this time, tau incidence with omega divided by tau incidence with sigma and all of that multiplied by the row of sigma. So these are the row and column operations that you need to, to get the clearing out. Um, and if you think about what's happening as a result of performing these row operations, um, remember this boundary map um, uh, that we've drawn, this, this k boundary map, is uh, when we were describing what homology does, or at least what diagonalization does, CK is some vector space uh, with, with you know, those dots representing simplices as basis elements. CK minus one is some vector space with dots representing uh, some uh, uh, simplices as well of K minus one dimension. And here is tau and here is sigma. And what we're doing is saying that that edge with weight tau sigma is the only thing that's allowed to touch tau or sigma. So we're sort of separating tau and sigma from every other simplex. We're just disentangling them. So there are lots of other uh, things, but nothing else is allowed to touch tau and nothing else is allowed to touch sigma except that one edge. That's what it means to have just that pivot in that row and column. Um, and because you have that non-zero entry, you can always um, do row operations and column operations so that this holds. I mean, you've completely disentangled sigma and tau um, and um, what that means from a, a homology perspective is that um, neither tau nor sigma will contribute to the homology um, because tau cannot possibly be in the kernel of, uh, um, uh, of del k, which is here, and, 
although sigma is in the kernel of del k minus one, it is also in the uh, image of del k, so it won't contribute to homology either. So they're both sort of dead, which is why you can get rid of them and, and only the critical syntheses count. So, um, so if that picture helps you, good. Otherwise, we can uh, sort of explicitly write down uh, the, the maps psi and phi, which implement this. Uh, this reduction and this reinflation, removing and adding um, sigma and tau. And so here they are. So for all alpha in K, so these are all simplices in K, and for all, um, let's say, omega in K minus sigma tau. So K minus sigma tau, remember, is the set of critical simplices for our sigma because sigma only paired sigma, uh, uh, only paired these two simplices with each other, the, the partial matching. So omega is critical and alpha is not. So we need, we need a way to send alpha to omega then a way to send uh, omega back to alpha. Um, and, and here it is. So we can write this map psi as a matrix whose uh, coefficient in the row of alpha, sorry, in the column of alpha and the row of omega is um, this magic uh, number that we had. Um, let's just write it down. It's the, it's the one in, um, it's the one in um, blue on the right, so those are the row operations. So minus tau omega divided by tau sigma. So this is going to be in case um, alpha is the same as sigma. It's going to be one if alpha is omega, but not equal to sigma, uh, sorry, not equal to tau, um, which the not equal to tau part is implicit because omega cannot equal tau anyway, and it's zero otherwise. So this map is almost the identity, if you think about it. Anytime alpha and omega are equal, they get sent to one. It only deforms um, when, the, when alpha is sigma. What it's doing is it's taking, um, taking um, sigma and, and uh, replacing it with all the, other, um, uh, all the other omega for which this is non-zero. There are going to be the other faces of tau that are not sigma. So if you think about the picture for a second, so here is sigma, here is tau. Uh, so this tau is filled in, and this was the pairing. Um, then the image of sigma is going to be uh, non-zero for, for those two. Uh, so it's going to push sigma with some algebraic signs to uh, the two other boundaries of tau. And uh, conversely, um, the map phi, which has to go in the other direction is omega to alpha. It's very pleasantly symmetric. So it has minus, um, so the entry we had uh, for the column operation. So alpha sigma divided by tau sigma. And this is going to be in the special case where um, alpha equals tau. It's going to be one if, um, if omega equals alpha and they're both not equal to sigma. Um, and it's zero otherwise. So this is sort of the inverse, um, not not exactly an inverse, but the backward chain uh, chain map. And uh, these two, so um, we want the last bit of uh, information we need is uh, why these are chain homotopy equivalents. So um, you can calculate, um, it's quite straightforward. I mean, the definitions are piecewise, but it's not so bad to check. Um, that uh, if you do phi followed by psi, this is actually equal to the identity on the Morse complex. So not so bad. Um, and if you go in, so this is, uh, so no need to check for chain homotopy. So not only are, uh, is this composite chain homotopic to the identity, but it's equal to the identity. So it's chain homotopic in the stupidest way possible. Uh, the other way is slightly more exciting. So this is chain homotopic to the identity on um, CK via, so I have to give you a chain homotopy that sends um, every, um, 
simplex alpha, so not every simplex alpha, but uh, every chain to a, a chain of dimension one higher. And this can be uh, implemented via the following matrix. Uh, it's one over tau sigma uh, if alpha equals uh, sigma and beta equals tau, and it's zero otherwise. Um, so that's a that's a full sort of description of what it takes to remove a single pair sigma and tau uh, that have been that have been matched by your acyclic partial matching. So, um, so that sounds like that's all you'd need. Why is there even a step two? I mean, you can do this for one uh, pair. Why do you need um, anything else? And the basic idea. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to describe it in as much detail as I um, as I did for the first part, is that the um, uh, ability to iterate this for more pairs, uh, so for sigma equals, you know, lots of sigma 1, tau 1, sigma 2, tau 2, you know, larger partial matchings, uh, doing this one at a time uh, requires a cyclicity of sigma. And, and this is why we are not doing this for arbitrary partial matchings, but rather acyclic partial matchings. And uh, I just want to tell you where the acyclicity plays a role. Um, the acyclicity plays a role by, um, uh, uh, by guaranteeing so uh, if you remove sigma 1 tau 1 using this process, uh, let's write it nicely, uh, removing sigma 1 less than tau 1 does not change uh, the coefficient of any other pairing sigma 2. Uh, so that, that number in the matrix remains unchanged. And the reason for that is, as I said, acyclicity. Because you see the, the, new, um, the difference between uh, the new value and the old value would have to be uh, by our formula for the Morse boundary, which is, I mean, it's the same as doing these, uh, uh, go back up here and doing these column operations. So what I'm saying is if, Alpha and Omega were another pair um, that were flagged by the matching. I'm claiming that doing all these column operations would never perturb, uh, never change that entry. And the reason it wouldn't change that entry is that the difference between the old and new is uh, precisely tau 1 colon sigma 2 multiplied by um, tau 2 colon sigma 1 divided by uh, tau 1 colon sigma 1. So plus or minus, that will be the difference. Um, and if you look at this, the numerator is not equal to zero if and only if sigma two is a face of tau one of co-dimension one and sigma one is a face of tau two of co-dimension one. But if both of these things were true, then you would get sigma one less than tau one bigger than sigma two less than tau two bigger than sigma one. And this would be not gradient. So this is where the second bit comes in. You want to iterate the above, but you want to make sure that the um, uh, that the Morse boundary stays the same as you add more and more cells to sigma. And that's um, so those incidences should not change. And that's where the acyclicity comes in. Okay, so that's it for this lecture. Hopefully, the the machinery makes sense. If it doesn't, you should try it out on a few. Uh, small examples. So um, the one I would recommend uh, for, you know, trying, you know, try it at home at the dark when no one else is looking um, is, is this one. Just an easy um, hollow two simplex with this matching. Show, you know, build, remove A, A, A C at, uh, in stage one and B, B, C at stage two and check that you are getting a chain homotopy equivalence. You can write all the formulas down nicely in this uh, example. Okay, great.
So this was the main result of uh, discrete Morse theory. In the next few lectures, we're going to see a version uh, of this for uh, persistent homology and again for sheaf homology to make uh, those computations easier, just as we did for ordinary homology. I'll see you there.